so given everybody's here to, to chat, chat Decred, uh, maybe you can give us a little bit of background, um, why you saw it was a good investment, uh, what your favorite aspects of the project are. Sure. So um, I went down the Decred rabbit hole when I was still at ARC, uh, so pre-placeholder. It was first uh, Willy Woo, who some of you may know from Twitter, um, who was poking me on it. And then um, uh, Charlie Lee tweeted about it at some point in 2016. He tweeted um, a list of assets that he thought had real, real utility and, and differentiation. And it was Bitcoin, of course, Litecoin, Monero, and then Decred. Um, I forget what the fifth was. Um, but the combination of Willie and Charlie got me to look um, more closely. I think one of my first realizations was the quality of the team. Um, Jake underplayed it a, a little bit, but the uh, BTC suite, which was an alternative full node implementation of Bitcoin Core, was written in Golang. Um, on all accounts, it was as quality um, an implementation um, as Bitcoin Core was. Um, and realizing that here was a Bitcoin Crade development team that had um, chosen to leave to build something um, that they felt improved upon Bitcoin uh, was compelling. That has since evolved into, uh, say, a more formal thesis where we think of uh, Bitcoin as being hyper-secure, adaptable, and sustainable. Uh, so the combo of proof of work, proof of stake actually makes it um, on a on-par basis more expensive to attack than proof of work alone. Um, in terms of the adaptability, you know, every network has to make decisions. It's just a matter of how you go about making those decisions. And Decred has put in uh, place a framework to allow a decentralized set of actors to efficiently make decisions. Um, and that allows it to evolve um, in, and, and, and adapt in an efficient manner. And then the sustainable aspect is uh, Decred's treasury currently has 600,000 units of DCR. Um, at current market prices, that's a $10 million treasury. Um, but of course, very dependent upon uh, the price of Decred. But what I really like um, and what I really liked when I was um, first going deep on Decred was there was no ICO, there was no exogenous injection of capital. What the Decred team did to capitalize themselves is they did an initial airdrop, 4% um, to whoever signed up, and then 4% uh, to uh, their treasury, which then allowed them to fund operations combined with the goodwill of, of Company Zero to start. Um, but then from there, the entire capitalization of the network has been based on capital appreciation of DCR itself. So there was never any investment that was taken in. Um, it's all grown out of the utility of the network um, being reflected in the price of the asset and therefore capitalizing the operations of the network. Uh, so from my perspective, um, I, I, I don't think I was following Trust. I think I missed the memo on, on Decred at some point in, in, in 2017, but um, I got to know Chris and then I was interviewing at, at Placeholder and the challenge that was given to me was uh, why don't you look into a network um, and let us know what you think of it and we actually have an idea for what that might be. Uh, so why don't you look at Decred. And I really hadn't heard of much about Decred at the time. And I also, you didn't tell me that you guys held Decred. So um, uh, I could have gotten that one very wrong. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I probably wouldn't be here today, though. though, though. Presumably, yeah, presumably there'd be some objectiveness to that if I came out super bearish on Decred. But uh, what really caught my eye is I decided to, to, the way I decided to go with that was to look at what was going on in the Decred network, um, what was going on in terms of ticket, uh, the ticket pool and ticket activity on the proof of stake side, what was going on with miners. Uh, and then what was going on across the ecosystem. And, and really there were a few things that really stood out. About 40 some percent of supply of Decred was, um, uh, was, was locked in, in, in proof of stake and there was significant engagement um, on the, both the governance and, and the voting uh, on the protocol. Um, they, Decred had implemented the, the prior year a change in their uh, ticket, ticket um, uh, pr their, 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 essentially their proof of stake difficulty uh, algorithm uh, that prices tickets uh, at every block. And uh, uh, Jake didn't go into this in a lot of depth, but uh, the upshot was it, it was extremely volatile. Ticket prices were very volatile. And the community really stepped up in a very big way um, to, to change that. Um, and that was pretty impressive. Um, and so I looked at that, and then uh, there was, at that point, there was um, sort of 
rumors about ASICs coming online, and I think hash rate had like doubled or something, and, and looked set to like explode, which it did ultimately, going something like 100x or something. 100x like that, yeah. in the last year. Um, so just looking at it objectively, I came out of it, um, and then I got on a call with Chris, and he's like, well, you didn't tell me if you're bullish or not, because uh, I tried to sidestep the question, but I said, well, I came out pretty excited about it. Um, and, then I, and then I realized that the sort of placeholder had accumulated a position in, in, in DCR. So I was glad I was able to, to, to research it sort of from an objective standpoint, I thought, and then um, uh, sort of align and come to my own conviction on, on, on the asset. Um, so that, that was exciting to me, and that's how I came to, to, to uh, appreciate Vgrid. Well, you shared a little bit about the network and spoke a little bit about the ecosystem um, in 2017, 2018. Um, looking forward, next 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, how do you see um, the crypto ecosystem broadly evolving and, and what place would you see Decred having in that? Hard question. Um, I think that you know, for us right now, we're focused on developer tools and networks and then um, for the say, mainstream use cases, those being financial. Um, really, blockchains are natively financial technology that collapse the cost of asset creation, custody, and transfer. Um, and I would argue that a lot of the, say, more technology-geared crypto networks, their success is contingent upon us nailing the financial components um, and making this just much easier for, for users to onboard and use. Um, and so, uh, I'd like to think that, well, hopefully our investment focus will dovetail with, with where um, we're seeing real traction. Um, where does Decred fit within that? I think Decred has um, one of the most elegantly constructed supply sides in the whole industry, um, where it's taken, taking into account the hardware um, that performs consensus uh, through proof of work, the stakeholders that make decisions, and then also the code creators, which I, I, I consider a form of supply cider. Um, and it is compensating all of those supply ciders. And it's constructed a elegant system of checks and balances to make sure that no single supply cider can run away um, with, with the keys to the network and the control to the network. So I think there's a lot to be learned um, from that model. And generally, when I have conversations with engineers um, and explain Decred supply side, um, they'll get excited um, and go and take learnings from it. Jake mentioned that Politea um, can easily be ported um, onto another blockchain. Potentially, it gets extended through Decred itself, and Decred becomes a governance chain where people are um, anchoring their voting um, money and transparency decisions um, all through Decred. So I think you know it's more of an open slate in terms of how Decred may work in. Yeah, so from... From our perspective, a lot of what we end up thinking about and talking about internally, obviously we're, we're a venture capital fund, so we think you know on 10-year horizons typically. And so uh, that's very much how we think about the assets in our portfolio and very much what drives us to this idea of governance as a differentiator. And so for me, that's where Decred comes in in that I don't think standing here in 2018, we can pre-specify all the features or um, all the community aspects that will make a network like Decred successful, really what we can do is we can specify the processes through which we can arrive at the right answers when those become apparent to us. So those things could be surrounding privacy, they could be surrounding you know, how networks uh, promote themselves, they could be any number of things. Um, really what we can do is specify the, way in w uh, th the ways through which as a community we come together um, and decide on those things in a way that you know doesn't leave us kind of in the situation that Jake described, where we're debating simultaneously debating on what the right answer should be, and then also debating on how what process we should use to arrive at the answer. Because of course, right, in, in that situation, let's say miners and stakers or miners and wallets disagree on how you should make a decision. Right, miners will say, well, no, just leave the decision to whoever has the most hash power. While you know potentially exchanges will say leave a decision to whoever custodies the most coins at any given time, right? So we can't be having those debates. We need to specify the ways in which we're going to reach decisions a priori. And so I think that's something that's incredibly differentiating uh, for Decred in that they've created incredible clarity uh, around how the community will resolve disputes in the future. And then the other thing that comes to the 10-year thesis uh, for Decred is the way that they've specified the ability of the protocol to be... Um, 
to be sustainable. Um, so what happens to a lot of the protocol teams once the money runs out? Right? Do, do we end up in a situation like what Jake described where he's building a full node implementation, uh, an alternative full node implementation for Bitcoin and not getting compensated? Or do we have mechanisms for those teams to sustainably fund themselves as they do so? So those are the things that I think really will differentiate Bcred beyond the 24 month period uh, and into the decades to come. So Alex, you touched on uh, dispute resolution. Uh, recently in, in October 2018, um, there was a change made to give stakeholders uh, control of the Decred treasury. Um, how would you see that playing out? What are the advantages, what are the disadvantages that you would see um, based on that decision? Um, so uh, we, we, th we think it's a brilliant experiment in, in the way crypto networks govern themselves, and I think it goes to this idea of sustainability, um, you know, that we specified a process where if we want, you know, let's say to hire a PR firm to get the word out about the asset, like how do we decide that as a community, right? Like what does it mean for like a crypto network to have a PR firm, right? Like these, this is like completely uncharted uh, territory. Um, so we think that there's advantages to the clarity in that process, the way Decred has specified Politea so that we, we have sort of an open process through which we debate things and keep people accountable, right? If, we, uh, if you said something at some time, it will be time stamped on Decred. Um, and then um, you won't be able to go back and say, well, I didn't say that, right? Uh, the way that the system engenders accountability, I think is one of its real advantages. Um, you know, in, in the long run, we're gonna have to figure out a, n a number of things, and I think it's gonna be an interesting uh, experiment. Um, we, uh, we look very much look forward as a, a, as a holder of Decred uh, to participating in that process and helping the community arrive at those answers. We do participate. You do. That's right. um, the, the, I, I wanna emphasize the point of accountability um, because what's great with Politea is there's a ledger for all conversations and all decision making um, that is immutable. Um, and if you enter, say, the crypto space in 2019, um, there's a lot of revisionist history um, that happened in the years past, which is hard to see and keep track of um, with a lot of different networks if they don't have some immutable record to keep track of, of how decisions were made um, and um, what, what went into that process. And I think you know, a great example is what's happened to Reddit between our BTC and our Bitcoin. Um, and for me, that was a learning in terms of understanding um, how brittle some of the communication platforms are around coordination. And yes, the communication platforms shift, but it's hard for, and, and so in the shifting, the core team is able to, to remain in sync, but I think it's hard for new people coming to the space of which the vast majority is in front of us, if crypto is to, to go mainstream, it's hard for people coming to the space now in 2019 to know where do I go to get um, the ledger of record on everything that's happened with the network. And so Decred is really planned out from day one of being able to have that history. Um, so I think that's, that's a super important component that will benefit it more and more and more. Um, yeah, I think over the last you know, several minutes, you both alluded to various ways that you're you know, evaluating the success of the project. Um, you know, how would you look at what's important? Um, you know, I think, Alex, you alluded to um, you know, paying attention to uh, you know, various ecosystem developments. Oh. <laughs> but then, Chris, um, you know, it seems like you, you were also alluding to um, you know, network participation. So I think there's, there's obviously many ways that one can evaluate success. You know, what metrics are you guys looking at to determine um, how things are going? Sure. Um, so I think you can break it into the supply side and the demand side. Um, so supply side would be, like I was saying earlier, uh, the miners, the stakers, and the developers. Um, miners, you know, we have ASICs coming online. Right now for Decred is kind of like what 2013 was for Bitcoin, um, where you just have hash rate going through the roof. Uh, I believe hash rate is up over 100x over the last year, um, and that's in a down market. Um, staking, you know, Prices of tickets are up about 40% year over year. Some of that is inflation-based, but it's the price appreciation of tickets has outpaced inflation. So it means um, it, people increasingly valuing um, the ability to govern Decred as a network and also the yield of earning um, new DCR um, in that process. 
in terms of the, um, and then you have you know 48% of DCR outstanding estate. Um, and then on the developer side, there's a great publication comes out every month, Decred Journal, that outlines everything that's going on with Decred. And I think if you um, stay abreast of that, you'll see how active the development is um, on Decred. Their roadmap is, is public as well with things like Lightning Network um, and privacy. Um, in terms of the demand side, um, I think the demand side is the question mark um, still for Decred. And um, I think the demand side is question mark for a lot of crypto. Um, and um, you know there are different ways, depending on the asset of what that demand side could be. I think for something like Decred or Bitcoin or these assets that are disinflationary going on deflationary, um, the, the benefit from spending has to outweigh the psychological cost of foregoing uh, potential gains. And so it needs to be better than buying a cup of coffee. Um, and this is where I don't know, um, uh, the, the, there's potentially options like extending Politea um, and still anchoring into Decred as a proof of work chain. And so then Decred becomes a governance chain. I think there are really interesting things to be done potentially with DCR, uh, DCR time, um, which is uh, Decred's time stamping. But the way we approach the demand side is we openly acknowledge it's an open question, but they have constructed a supply side um, with sustainability and adaptability such that we have conviction they will be around long enough to find killer applications and to bring on that demand side. Uh, a really critical component of, of the demand side, uh, as you mentioned, and, and, and I agree with the way that you, you, you set that out, is liquidity. Uh, and so <laughs> this, this, this event hopefully being one of many uh, where uh, we see fiat pairs for Decred, where we see other crypto pairs for Decred, where we see Decred listed and allowing consumers to access it. And Chris, you've been doing a lot of fantastic work um, around bootstrapping liquidity, working with service providers and so forth. Like I view those as prerequisites to getting the demand side on board. It needs to be easy for people to access the asset in order to use it. So maybe you can talk about some of that. Sure. It's, I mean, it's one of the things we do at Placeholder is building out, helping teams build out market infrastructure. We believe teams should be focused on the technology. Um, and actually, we, as a venture firm that specializes in crypto, get economies of scale. Um, in knowing all of the custodians, knowing all of the exchanges, and being able to um, help our teams build those relationships and those integrations in a way that's much more efficient because it's what we specialize in doing, whereas a team has to do it zero to 60 all on their own each time that they want to do it. Um, so that's been a big part of what we've been working on uh, with Decred um, because, you know, the Decred team has been focused pretty much solely on the technology. Um, and that's why a lot of people just haven't heard about Decred um, and are surprised at the merits of the project when they do, when they, uh, do go deeper into it. I think, um, so that's, that's, say, on the market infrastructure side. I think you know, another potential demand driver in the next cycle will be people seeing Decred as a great alternative store of value to Bitcoin um, with its hyper-secure, adaptable, and sustainable properties. Um, and this is where um, I understand the um, Bitcoin, say, minimalist or maximalist contingent that believe you should only hold Bitcoin. Um, and I understand that worldview, and I've read the Bitcoin standard. Um, but I think that most investors, institutional investors that you end up talking with, or just your casual retail investors, are not comfortable with sole exposure to a single asset. Um, and so finding... Um, Alternative assets that are targeting similar visions in slightly different ways, um, I think, becomes a short to medium term demand driver for Decred that sets it up for the longer term demand sides. It's so great. Both um, Chris, you and Alex uh, touched on uh, liquidity and, and how um, you know, exchanges can fit into the, the roadmap and the ultimate success of um, Decred. I think this is what the foundation of a healthy partnership uh, might look like. Um, you know, maybe would you be able to expand on the, the possible benefits of, um, of having a fiat pair available? Sure. Um, so I think fiat pairs um, are really important for crypto assets because it's an exogenous source of capital. And so if you're only quoted um, in crypto pairs, primarily being BTC and ETH, um, then you're really beholden to what's going on with those assets. Um, and if value is draining out of those assets, then it's also going to be draining out of your asset. Um, and so 
it's very helpful, I think, to have fiat pairs, particularly in bear markets, um, to just provide a steady flow of exogenous capital um, into the network. So I'm super happy um, that OKCoin is going to be providing a fiat pair to Decred. Um, Decred definitely needs more fiat pairs. Uh, and then, you know, liquidity broadly is an interesting question because generally, yes, you want, you want these assets to be more liquid and so that there's not a lot of slippage if someone comes in. I think we have a lot of conversations internally about what is the liquidity profile necessary for different kinds of assets? Because not every crypto asset is equal. And for governance crypto assets, um, maybe having some amount of illiquidity is actually a feature and not a bug. Um, in that it makes it harder to amass a large amount of the asset, um, which is just another speed bump to trying to a attack the network through amassing the asset. You know, it's a, it's a half-baked thought, um, but I think there is something to um, not every um, crypto asset needs the exact same liquidity profile. Okay, great. And um, as you folks are, are well aware, um, you know, we will be um, listing Decred later on in the week, I think. Uh, if you're familiar with OKCoin, if you've been following us for the last several weeks and months, um, we're very careful to select projects that we think are quality um, that will benefit from additional liquidity, whose um, inclusion in our uh, our network and whose availability to our community will actually be positive for crypto development. And so um, we're excited. Uh, we're excited for this. Um, thanks for joining us and thanks for speaking to these wonderful folks. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elaine. I head our lead or lead our token listing initiative. So I'm really excited to see you all here. Really happy to have Decred join our platform. I'm really looking forward to kind of what the next years will look like um, in our partnership. Um, so thank you all again for coming and joining us for this. Um, uh, I know we are running a bit behind. I know I'm sure you guys are eyeing the food and maybe drink refills. But I did want to open the floor to any questions, if anyone has any for any of our speakers. Yes. And if you could just, here, you know what, I'm just, actually, yeah, let's try with the mics. And then if you could just um, let us know who you're directing your question to. Uh, so I guess mostly placeholder, but also Decred. I know there's been a lot of kind of um, hostile uh, activity within kind of the Ethereum ecosystem recently, especially with EFRI, the, the hard fork coordinator, kind of leaving the Ethereum ecosystem related to um, kind of just like related conflicts of interest where um, basically kind of, he, he on Twitter he was talking about um, Polkadot and people thought that his kind of motives for delaying a lot of the hard fork um, development was for uh, like Polkadot to kind of come in as a kind of competitor and kind of take over the the mind share developers and so forth. Um, so I guess this is a very much a kind of like political question which relates to governance. But how does I guess placeholder as a um, large token holder of Decred uh, take into account like potential conflicts of interest related to um, politicking as well as kind of um, voting for things that may be kind of in, in competing with uh, Decred and other sort of projects like that. So um, first to the Ethereum point and then um, to Decred. Every crypto network is going to have to make hard decisions. Um, and so it's a matter of being purposeful about the way in which the decisions are made. And if you're not going to put in place a framework for making decisions, then that is a decision in and of itself. Um, and the stakes of these processes only go up as the network value scales. Um, and that's why, for example, if you look at Bitcoin early on, there were some instances where miners moved really fast. Um, but that was when Bitcoin was much smaller. Um, and I think we're starting to see similar things with Ethereum, where as Ethereum scales and the stakes grow and there's not formal mechanisms around governance, there are these really vicious debates that happen. Um, and so this is where actually with Ethereum, we're seeing things like Moloch DAO, and we're seeing, say, secondary layers of governance bolted, out, uh, bolted on to try and provide that consistency in governance. So I think that most networks are going to end up converging um, on, say, formal governance frameworks. I think Bitcoin might be the exception, and it might be, um, um, given its particular properties, able to, to get away with that. Um, and you know, I'm bullish on, on Bitcoin. 
um, to be to be clear about that. I think in terms of um, decred, um, my partner Joel has a, a, a line where he'll say um, off-chain dip diplomacy but on-chain governance. And off-chain diplomacy does happen. Um, that is a function of human nature. Um, and you know, there's Phil Dian who's done some great work on dark DAOs and um, vote buying. And I think a lot of these things are, um, we're, we're gonna learn the hard way. There are gonna be some massive failures. Um, and um, I mean, you know, I, I just look at how much we learned from the DAO with an Ethereum and actually how much activity that later ended up kicking off. So we always learn from the massive failures. Um, I think that what's important with Decred um, is that yes, there will be off-chain diplomacy, um, but the on-chain mechanics and how things are set up and how things are gonna work are clear to everyone from the beginning and so there's no dispute around those mechanisms. I mean, in terms of governance layer, governance is really about <clears throat> making decisions for a, for a collective group. If there's a large number of people, governance is going, well, should we have universal health care or should we let everybody, I don't know, poop in the street? And people who live here are intimately familiar with the second option. <laughs> and uh, governance really comes down to things like this, making group decisions that are difficult, like nobody wants to scoop up the poop, who's gonna do that? You know, like, these are the kind, so, so to me, governance is really just the, the process of making decisions for a group in a, at least, nominally reasonable way. And, and, and I think the question was around potentially extending Politea. So I, th I think a lot of, say, the more intricate governance mechanisms will come in the application interface layer. Decred is a pretty simple machinery for voting, money, and transparency. I guess conversations, voting, money, and transparency around that process. Um, and so that machinery, and this is what we're gonna see just across the board with protocols versus application interfaces. The protocol should remain you know, as thin as possible to enable all of the core functionalities while the application interface will customize things for the end user. And so, you know, could this be used for a nation state? Potentially, that's a really big application interface to build, but I think the core tenets of the machinery are there. I, I think where you, where you, where you start, so, uh, so, uh, so, so where, where you start, I think with that is, um, Decred right now is working on, on Decred governance problems, right? So Politea is about solving a problem for Decred. Um, Maybe at some point in the future, solving that problem for Decred means somebody else can say, well, I can use that for my application and so forth. But I don't think it's really, and Jake, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't, it doesn't sound like Decred would be wise right now to first figure out everybody else's governance problems. Um, right. <laughs> that, that seems like a full-time job. Right? Our city clean, right? <laughs> you know, keep that tight, and then we can sort of talk about sort of extending the model in other and maybe we'll do one last question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, the at least three dominant crypto narratives right now, uh, the sound money, DeFi, and then Web3, which is essentially non-financial use cases where you're connecting supply and demand and doing this intermediation. Uh, I just wanted to get your take on, especially the, the guys from Placeholder, on uh, how do you see DeFi in the next three to five years? Is it on solid ground? Do you think there's a real opportunity or there's too much hype? And the same thing on Web3 as well. We've had a lot of protocols, like Origin is a good example, trying to connect supply and demand in non-financial use cases. But when we talk about things like decentralized Uber and decentralized Airbnb, are these even realistic? And, and how do you see that evolving over the next few years? So I think DeFi is much more a short to medium term um, thing to be bullish on than Web3. I think Web3 is a longer term vision and a lot of it is contingent upon us nailing a, a bunch of these financial components. Um, and I think that you know, actually in the short to medium term, a lot of say pragmatic approaches where there's um, some centralized concessions 
are going to take place, a lot of vertical integration um, to allow speed to market. We're going to learn a lot from those. Um, and then say the final vision of small pieces loosely joined materializes over the next couple of decades. Um, and that's really, um, you know, the small pieces loosely joined vision is because in order to, to, to build off of a small pieces loosely joined infrastructure, you need all of those independent pieces to come together. And we're seeing lots of them come together now, but they're still in their infancy. Um, so I think that, you know, the proximate bull market, one of the main narratives where people will see utility and people will, will, will get excited and yes, overshoot inevitably will be the DeFi space. Um, and then, you know, we'll get another crash and um, maybe in that proximate crash is really where we start to see more Web3 things um, uh, gaining actual utility and adoption there and sets up for another cycle. I did. I, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, you, you mentioned at the end of your question about things like decentralized Uber, decentralized Airbnb. I think that something to keep in mind from an engineering perspective is that it's very easy to talk about decentralizing some uh, these certain complex things like staying in somebody's house or you know like uh, riding in someone's car, but what you'll notice about things like say proof of work and proof of stake is that they're, they they keep it intentionally simple. And so by keeping it simple, you can create a game that's fair and iterate it and then derive a benefit from it. The more complex a, you know, a, you know, a piece of infrastructure is that you're trying to replace, the, the harder it is to, to create, to gamify it, right? You know, like how are you gonna turn Airbnb into a game? I mean, you know, hate to circle back to keeping the city clean, but there you go, right? <laughs> 